Welcome back to my channel. If this is the first time that you're seeing any of my videos, my name is Bwandunji and I am so glad that you're here. And guess what? Today we are celebrating 200 subscribers. Thank you so much for clicking that subscribe button and watching the videos and letting me know what it is that you think. In celebration for Indie April, I am going to be giving away one copy of a novel from an independently published author and I will let you know at the end of the this video so stick around so today we are going to start our what I learned about writing series and we're discussing the dream blood duology by NK Jemisin it is comprised of two books the killing moon is the first one in the series and the second one is the shadowed Sun like I had mentioned before I listened to the audiobook version of the series and then I went ahead and bought the ebook because I found the story so compelling for me and I needed to know why. So I'm studying it as a way to help me improve my writing. What better way to learn how to write stories that are interesting to you than studying stories that you love? So it combines two of my favorite things, reading and writing. It's like the best thing ever. Who gets to do this? I do. All right, so <laughs> let's go ahead and talk about this. I'll just bring up the page from Wikipedia. This is the synopsis on Wikipedia for The Killing Moon. The book follows Ehiru, a gatherer who has sworn to help keep the peace in the city of Gujare. It is they who must gather together magic while people sleep, using the magic for altruistic purposes as well as to protect the city from the corrupt. However, when dreamers begin dying, the murder seemingly done in the name of the city's dream goddess, Ehiru must find out who is doing this and why before the city is destroyed in the process. Now, in order for us to continue to talk about this in a way that makes sense, I need to lay sort of another layer of foundation. So when I say something, you know what I'm talking about. The city is Gujare and the citizens are called Gujarin. There are neighbors to the north who are nomadic and they trade with the Gujarin. Sometimes they're in the city, some, some choose to stay. Sometimes they're just caravans that are passing through the city doing trade. There's also a neighboring state called Kisua. The author has said that this book is sort of loosely based on Egypt and Nubia that in ancient times were warring kingdom. The second layer is that the Gujarin worship a dream goddess called Hananja. And Hananja rules over the dream world in an eternal sleep kingdom called Inakare. Inakare is kind of like heaven. Hananja, the dream goddess, has priests. And these priests have different jobs, but these particular stories, the Killing Moon and the Shadowed Sun, both deal with gatherers. Gatherers use narcomancy, which is lucid dreaming to help souls get to Inakare. You can petition to be gathered yourself or a family member can do that for you. Then the gatherer comes in the middle of the night and in a sort of lucid dreaming state guide you into sort of this eternal joyous space that they build for you. That's where your soul gets to live for eternity. You can also be forcefully gathered if you have been a corrupt person. Whenever a soul is gathered, dream blood is collected. And that dream blood has this strange effect on the gatherers. It makes them sort of drunk or high, something. It affects their brain chemistry. And sometimes the gathering is also done by priestesses. Now these priestesses are called Hananja's sisters and they use their sexual prowess to draw dream blood from believers. There's also a gathering of dream bile. So there's dream blood and there's dream bile and we can imagine what dream bile is. It's bitter, it's the stuff of nightmares and you get it from people so that they can rest peacefully. Now you have sort of the basic structure of these particular people and we can talk about this story in a way that makes sense. Gujara has Gujarin, there's a Kisua state that is close by, and the nomadic northerners. Hananja is their goddess. They go to Inakare. Some of the priests are called gatherers who help souls get to Inakare using narcomancy. And there are also priestesses who use their sexual prowess to collect dream blood for the priests. So far, we're just talking about chapter one. It was a brilliant beginning to the story, a great introduction to the story, containing a lot of symbols and messages that appear later in the story. You don't know that until you're done with the story and start again. It is a gem, it's like an onion. There's so many things to peel open. We are following the journey of Ehiru, the gatherer priest, 
who is going through the city of Gujarat to fulfill the commissions that have been brought. The first one was brought by a man whose father is old and dying. His soul needs to be gathered so he doesn't continue to suffer in this world. His name is Yeyezu, and when Ehiru gets there, Yeyezu wakes up. But he's not scared because he's looking forward to Inakare. He takes him into the lucid dream and builds this fantastic place. There's so much joy, there's so much amazing dream blood that he gets really, really high. He has to count in groups of four in order to sort of stabilize his mind again and go and do the next thing. On his way to the next gathering, we hear him go through the city and we get a sense of the place that Yeyezu lives. You can hear a baby crying, you can hear a couple making love, you can hear people in the street. So there's this sense that there's a large population and buildings that are close together. And you wouldn't imagine that this is sort of the more affluent part of Gujarat. We also get to understand how the gatherers prefer to do their jobs quietly because he changes his disguise as he goes through the city from the poor sections of Gujarat to the more affluent sections of the city. We also get a sense of the grandeur of the house for his second commission. He goes to the man's house and this particular man is not even Gujarin. He is a northerner of the Brahmarte people and does not necessarily believe in the dream goddess Hananja. But he lives in the city and someone has submitted a commission on his behalf. When Ehiru enters the man's room, this man doesn't wake up. So he goes hunting for him in his dream. And while he is there, he cannot find him. He finds instead this giant hole with like grasping hands. He falls through the hole and finds him like huddled in a corner, just shivering and tries to encourage him to work together to build this beautiful dream to get away from the grasping hands, the nightmare that he has created from his mind. But this man is very, very resistant to him. One of the most sacred things that the Gujarin people have is their dream name. And it is not just given willy-nilly to anybody. But as a priest, when Ehiru enters the Brahmarte man's dream, he is given a name. He's given the name of this merchant. And what he finds is a belligerent man who is not willing to go to Inakare and doesn't want to have anything to do with Hanan. Nanja, he calls her a demon goddess, uses this name on Ehiru, he calls him Agualo, which means demon. I'm not going to Inakari. I would not go there and all of you are just suckers. You want to suck the life out of us. You enjoy this. And Ehiru tries to plead with him, but to no avail. And then the man uses Ehiru's dream name when he had not told him what his dream name was. And it was such a surprise for Ehiru that he backed away from the man and actually came out of the lucid dream, not severing the man's soul tie properly at all. And the man's soul just flies off. Because this is the worst thing that a gatherer could do to a person. Ehiru has a physical reaction. He throws up and then he feels a certain kind of energy and stands up. And when he looks out the window, he can see the silhouette of a person. All he feels between them is malevolence. As he moves his body, the silhouette mirrors exactly his movements. When Ehiru stands still to just watch what is going to happen, the silhouette climbs onto one of the building's roofs and goes off. So that is what happened in chapter one. It was very exciting. I learned a whole bunch of things, but I have six different items that I would like to discuss. The first thing that I learned is playing with the storyteller. So what do I mean when I say playing with the storyteller? So for instance, you could have a storyteller who starts out the story in a way that makes you wonder whether you're getting the right information. As in this particular story, they may have a particular bias. Let me read to you a sentence right at the beginning of chapter one. The barbarians of the North taught their children to fear the dreaming moon, claiming that it brought madness. This was a forgivable blasphemy. Right from the beginning, you understand that the religion of the people of Gujare, the religion of the Gujarin, is important to the storyteller. So that when somebody has a different opinion, then you can forgive their blasphemy. It's blasphemy, but you can forgive it. That is how we understand who the storyteller is. So later on, when they describe the people of the North, we can wonder to ourselves whether their point of view is skewed, is biased against those tribes. Now, most of us end up trusting the voice of the person who is telling the story because we have not had a chance to see many instances where the storyteller is untrustworthy. This storyteller actually becomes a character in the story 
that you're telling, the storyteller, then is imbued with characteristics that allow us to enjoy the story in a certain way. The second thing is that we were introduced to Gujare by going with Ehiru through the city. As he goes through the poorer sections of the city, nobody ever says the buildings are close together, but you get the sense because you understand you can hear all kinds of noises coming from different homes. It also allows us to quickly assess the character of the city. Is it a safe city to be in? What are the people like? Do they do the kind of things that we're used to people in our cities doing? Is it a bustling city? Are there inequalities in this place? The third point I found interesting because I struggle with this as well. Many of us, when we're writing our stories, we're tempted to say her skin was like cream or porcelain or chocolate or tawny like a lion or whatever it is that you choose to describe somebody's skin color. But I found, and I don't know whether it's simply because N.K. Jemisin is a woman of color, but here's this sentence, trusting the darkness of his skin for the camouflage as he crept along, guided by the sounds of the city. So without any hesitation, you know that he is actually a dark skinned character. I found that to be great. And I think I'm going to try and use different ways of describing people against the environment in which they're existing in order to let them know what the skin color of the character is. The fourth thing, front loading your story with its essence and with the main thrust of the plot so that you can capture the mind of the reader to turn the page and try to find out what happened. Now, of course it can backfire because if you start escalating the tension right at the beginning, how far can you take it without exhausting the reader? I recently read a book and towards the end of it, I thought to myself, I can't feel anxious for the character anymore. I'm exhausted. Also, with certain stories where different sorts of worlds are being created, a different language, different customs, you can end up with so much jargon in the very first chapter and lose your reader instead because it's just too complicated to follow. The fifth thing is that right at the beginning of the story, we are introduced to what is considered good and what is considered bad in the world of the gatherers. We get to see Ehiru usher Yeyezu into this wonderful dreamscape where he's going to live in Inakare, joyful and happy forever. And then we get to see him deal with the Bromarte man in his dream and how that completely backfired and caused the gatherer to have a physical reaction and to lose the soul. We know that this is good and this is bad. This should be done and this shouldn't be done right at the beginning. It helps us understand the world better and understand where we should be putting our emotions so that when we see something bad is about to happen, that raises the anxiety of the reader as opposed to sort of them not knowing whether this is a good or bad thing, especially in worlds that you are creating from scratch. The moral values there may be completely different from ones that we know. Finally, at the end of this particular chapter, we were introduced to the malevolent force of the story. And you get the inkling that this is what is happening, right? Any bad sort of malevolent force that is doing something mysterious that we do not expect it to be doing is something we'll want to find out about. And was it the cause for the dream? Is this what happens when it's close to a gatherer? Was it actually in the dream? Because how did the man know Ehiru's dream name? Just like controlling the rising tension of a book, controlling the interactions with a malevolent or evil or dark force in a story, controlling the number of interactions will make sure that the rising tension does not happen too fast because that can become very difficult to sustain. So those are the six things that I learned about writing and going through the story and talking about what I learned. I'm so eager to get the points out to you that I forget to ask questions. So I'm asking questions in this particular segment. I would like to know if you have read The Killing Moon and if you have and you did a review on Goodreads, please go ahead and leave your link to the review on Goodreads in the comment section below. If you haven't read it, did this chapter one encourage you to read it? The other question that I want to ask, because I had never come across it before, is this idea of playing with a storyteller. One of the things that I'm thinking about is how do you create a storyteller who is not trustworthy, 
where the reader is continually questioning themselves whether they should really take sides with the storyteller or against them. It's curious and I want to understand it better, so there may be a video in the future about how to play around with the voice of the storyteller. Let me know in the comment section below what you think about playing with the voice of the storyteller. So I did make a promise at the beginning of this video that I would let you know how it is you can enter to win an ebook by an independently published author because this is Indie April and we need to support this particular industry. It allows authors to be closer to their readership. It allows them to have greater access to their own money that they made from writing a book. It allows more people to publish stories. In the description box below, there will be a form. I will need to know that you are a subscriber to this channel. If you've not yet subscribed and you want to subscribe, please go ahead and do it. I will be purchasing for you an ebook copy of Natalia Lee's book, Song of the Dryad. She is one of the author tubers here on YouTube. I watch her videos a lot. They have been very, very helpful in understanding how to independently publish a book. She's also very prolific in her writing, runs her own business. So it's interesting to see how somebody else is living their life as a writer and be encouraged by their own journey through this whole writing process. It is convoluted, it can be difficult, but people have done it successfully and so can you! Go ahead and fill out the form in the description box below. That is all that I have for you today. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up! Subscribe to this channel and I will see you in the next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye!